Good afternoon and welcome to today's briefing. We're looking forward to discussing the basics of the Medicaid program with all of you, as well as implications of the Medicaid continuous coverage unwinding. I'm, I'm Allison Northrup, Senior Policy Officer at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which is the nation's largest philanthropy dedicated solely to health. For the past 50 years, RWJF has been a trusted, nonpartisan source of information on policy to improve health and well being. Since its creation in 1965, Medicaid has become the nation's single largest health insurer, covering approximately one in five Americans and serving as a critical lifeline to protect the health and well being of individuals and families in the United States. In March 2020, Congress enacted the Families First Coronavirus Response Act in response to the COVID 19 pandemic. Among many other things, this bill paused removing enrollees from the Medicaid program until after the end of the public health emergency. Over the last three years, primarily due to that continuous enrollment provision, Medicaid enrollment has grown substantially by roughly 23 million individuals and the uninsurance rate has dropped. In December, 2022, as part of the fiscal year 2023 appropriations bill, Congress delinked the continuous enrollment provision from the public health emergency and established an end date for the continuous enrollment provision of March 31st, 2023. Starting on April 1st of this year, states began to resume annual Medicaid eligibility reviews. As a result, so far, at least 1.5 million people have been disenrolled from Medicaid, with estimates predicting that between 8 million and 24 million enrollees could lose Medicaid coverage by the end of the unwinding. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services estimates that 15 million people will be disenrolled, including 5 million children and 10 million adults, and that nearly 7 million of those who are disenrolled will actually still be eligible for Medicaid, but will lose coverage due to procedural or administrative reasons. The Congressional District Health Dashboard, uh, created by New York University Grossman School of Medicine with funding from RWJF, tracks key measures of health and drivers of health by state and congressional district. Relevant to today's conversation, the, the dashboard includes data on the uninsured rate for each congressional district. And I'm excited to announce that today, the team at, um, in the Department of Population Health at NYU Grossman School of Medicine finalized data on Medicaid enrollment by congressional district that showcases the reach of the Medicaid program. We encourage you to check out the dashboard to see trends nationally, regionally, in your state, in your district, across 35 metrics of health and the drivers of health. You can find a link to the dashboard in the chat, I'm sure, just momentarily. The Medicaid enrollment data is not yet live on the dashboard website. It's that fresh, um, but you can request the data from the NYU team directly by emailing the dashboard email address that we'll also post in the chat. An understanding of Medicaid and its place as part of our nation's health insurance network, and particularly amid the unwinding, that's all important context for the work that you and your colleagues do. Today's conversation will begin with an overview of the Medicaid program to give us all a foundational understanding. We'll then discuss how states and people who rely on this safety net program are responding to the end of the Medicaid continuous enrollment provision, as well as states, ways that states are using Medicaid in innovative ways to serve their residents and tailor the program to best meet the unique circumstances in each state. We'll have time for Q&A at the end, um, so please be sure to put your questions in the chat throughout the discussion and we will get to them um, at the conclusion of the formal presentation. Joining me for that um, presentation and discussion today are two experts who work closely with state Medicaid programs, Lynn Blewett and Hamie Tuarsen, Tuarsen, excuse me. Um, Lynn Blewett is the founding director at the University of Minnesota State Health Access Data Assistance Center known as SHADAC and a professor in the Division of Health Policy and Management. SHADAC is a health policy research center and program of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that's focused on translating complex research findings into actionable information 
that is accessible to a broad audience. Next, I'd like to introduce Hamey Tuarsen, the Executive Director of the National Academy for State Health Policy, known as NASHP. NASHP, likewise, is a nonpartisan organization committed to providing technical assistance, research, and analysis, and sharing best practices to advance state health policy innovations. With that, Lynn and Hamey, I'll turn things over to you. Um, please take it away. Great, thank you, Allison. Um, I'm very happy to join you. I was once a Hill staffer way back when, and I always appreciated these uh, overviews that helped, helped to sort of set the foundation for complex health policy issues, which um, there are many. So we're gonna go through um, like three, three different topics. We were covering Medicaid basics and then the COVID impact and the Medicaid unwinding. And then Hamey will talk a little bit about state innovation in terms of what states are doing around um, innovation in terms of providing equitable and accessible care. Uh, next slide, please. So just so we're all on the same foundation, I wanted to do a little level setting here. So next slide, please. We're going to talk a little bit about Medicaid. It was an acted as an entitlement program. And that just means that if you're eligible, you're entitled to receive benefits. And so there is no cap on funding. There is no cap on or a waiting list for eligibility. It's an entitlement program. And it was passed as part of um, when Medicare was passed and they pass them as amendments to the Social Security Act. So sometimes you'll see Medicare as Title 18 and Medicaid as Title 19. That just refers to the title within the Social Security Act. Um, this Medicaid program is financed both by the federal and state governments and the federal government provides matching payments to the states. And those are set in statute. So, um, for the federal government provides matching payments from 50% to 77.86%. And this is based on the average income compared, the state average income compared to the national income. So that just means that lower income states receive a higher match and higher income states receive a lower match. And the 50% is the floor. So you can't go below 50%. There is a higher match for the Children's Health Insurance Program, and that is under Title 21 of the Social Security Act. And that match is 65%. The range is 65% of the, as the floor and 84.5% as the ceiling. So the state administers the programs under general federal guidance, but the states have a lot of options to cover optional benefits, eligibility levels, to do innovation through waiver programs, and we're going to talk about some of those. But I think the, ma the main point is that each state Medicaid program is unique and somewhat complex. Next slide, please. When you think about Medicaid and Medicare, they're really very different programs, although um, established under the Social Security Act and financed by the federal government. So for Medicaid eligibility, it's low income individuals and families, disabled, elderly, and some low income Medicare can be eligible for both Medicare and Medicaid, we call those dual eligibles. The Medicare program, as you may know, are for people over 65, under 65 with disabilities who qualify for disability benefit, and people with end-stage renal disease. Both programs cover a comprehensive list of benefits and um, fairly comprehensive. Medicare is a little more complex in terms of how it uh, has established those benefits with, Medi with Part A, Part B, Part C, Part D, and each of those has its own co-payments and deductibles and a significant amount of co-payments. Under Medicaid, there's no cost for most, most groups in the program, no co-pays or deductibles. Um, there may be a small co-payment in some states for the expansion population, and there's some for um, expansion of, of children's health insurance that are separate from the Medicaid program. The government spends $728 billion in 2021 on the Medicaid program, and the federal government funded 69% of that, and the states funded 31% of that, which is kind of an interesting to think of the role that the federal government plays in the Medicare, in the Medicaid program, although the states really administer. Um, this 84 million people are covered, and this does not include the um, CHIP program. If you add CHIP and the expansion, I think some cite 92 million people if you add additional 
um, additional uh, programs. This is compared to Medicare, where the federal government has spent $829 billion, covering 65 million people. Next slide, please. So that kind of um, Medicaid serves as a really important safety net program. It covers one out of every three children in this country and 70% of low income children. Two out of three nursing facility residents are covered under the Medicaid program. It covers 40% of all births and 50% of people with HIV receiving care. There are a number of other statistics I could throw at you, but this is kind of the basics that it is an important safety net program for low income populations. Next slide, please. So during the, um, the ACA provided the opportunity for states to expand Medicaid, and you probably have heard of that, uh, 40 states have expanded. They could expand to adults without children up to 138% of the federal poverty level, which is about $20,000 for an individual in 2023. I always try to remember you know, that one, one number in my head because people will always say, well, what, how, what, how, who's eligible for Medicaid and how much is that? So just think about one person making $20,000 would be eligible. Um, the federal government on the Medicaid expansion pays, this is the match is higher here. So now we're up to our, let's see, we're one, two, th third matching rate. Of, the federal government pays 90% of the Medicaid expansion and the state government pays 10%. And you can see here the 10 states that have not expanded. And I'm sure if you have questions, we'd be happy to ask those, answer those at the end of the session. Next slide, please. So we did want to talk, touch base on the COVID impact and the current issue right now, which we're calling the great unwinding on the Medicaid program. And there's a lot, a lot of articles and um, tweets and all kinds of people talking about this issue. So we wanted to make sure you had, a, had some, some basic information about what's going on. Next slide, please. So in 2020, the Congress passed the Families First COVID Response Act, and this provided, um, in addition to funding for states and testing and treatment, it provided a provision in the Medicaid program that allowed for continuous Medicaid coverage. And that just me meant that if you signed up for Medicaid during this period, the Medicaid program could not disenroll you. The intent was to include, you know, to provide needed care during a national crisis. And remember, at the beginning of the crisis, we didn't really know what was going on and how many people would be affected. And so this was a, um, a safety net for those vulnerable populations, but also those who were losing their jobs and had no employer-sponsored insurance. Um, the, the states who agreed to do, all states agreed to do this continuous coverage. Again, it was an option, option for states. They agreed to do it. And in exchange, they got a 6.2 percentage point increase in that matching payment, which was a significant amount of money to states to continue to provide coverage for people on their program. This continuous coverage provision ended on March 31, 2023. And now states are redetermining eligibility for all those that they have enrolled over the last couple of years. There was a huge growth in the Medicaid enrollment during this period. It went from 23.3 million to 95 million. 7.3 million children accounted for 31% of the enrollment growth. And states are given 14 months to start, starting in April, to determine, redetermine eligibility. Um, the Department of Health and Services estimated that 15 million could lose Medicaid coverage. So we're all sort of watching the numbers. We've, we've, I've been on many, both Amy and I have been on many meetings. How do we know what's happening to people? Are they finding coverage once they've been disenrolled? Is there another option for them? And states are really scrambling to make sure that people have who are eligible for Medicaid stay on Medicaid, or if they're not eligible, maybe they're eligible for marketplace plans or an employer-sponsored plan. And so there's just a lot of scrambling around um, for these people who are potentially not eligible for the Medicaid coverage. Next slide, please. So this is a map of when states, again, states are given a lot of flexibility on doing their un unwinding process. This is a state about when they're gonna start. So you can see some are start, have already started right away. Some are starting in July, some are starting this fall. 
States have up to 14 months to complete this. So there's different strategies and processes for how to um, do the unwinding. And most states are planning to use the full nine to 12 months to complete uh, this process. I'm gonna turn it over to Hamey, who's gonna add some, some color, color commentary about what the states are doing. And um, again, thank you for the opportunity. I look forward to the questions. Yeah, thank you, Lynn. Um, hi, everyone. It's great to be here with you today, even if it's virtual. I have to say, I'm, I was particularly pleased to be asked to do this. I'm a Medicaid lawyer by training, and so I have studied this program for a long time, and now I'm sort of in a different position um, working with states. And one thing just to reflect from my comments today, um, we here at Nashby work with all states as as Allison mentioned, we are nonpartisan. We've been around for 35 years, so we um, work with red, blue, purple states, and we really are um, their trusted partners on state health policies. So we convene them, we provide technical assistance, we engage them, we talk to them about, you know, how are things really going and, and how can we help them sort of move um, forward and, and really achieve um, what they want in terms of improving outcomes for their populations. So that's like, it's with that um, sense, we, we, um, we are the pseudo association for the state-based marketplaces and we run a children's coverage network. So some of my comments say on Medicaid and wine specifically um, come from those that work that we've done. And then we also do a lot of different um, technical assistance projects around things like social determinants of health and incarcerated populations and Medicaid managed care that I'll talk about on the innovation side, just to orient you to who I am and, and why, why I'm giving you these remarks. So um, Lynn did such an excellent job of just um, really starting to talk about the Medicaid unwind. The, the, the pieces I would add are, you know, states are in different um, places on Medicaid unwind, both in timing and the, the size of their state and the number of people that are really have to go through this process. And I do want to just underscore, like, this is an unprecedented event. States have never had to redetermine eligibility of this many people in this short of a time frame. So, you know, I, I think we are learning and evolving. That's, that's the term I like to use um, about the Medicaid unwind process, because there is a lot happening all at the same time. And I'll just say in terms of timing and understanding the data and what's coming out now, there were five states that began their first terminations in April, another 14 began their first terminations in May, and then another 22 um, beginning in June. And so we are pretty early on in this process, quite frankly, that's going to go on for the next 12 months, um, because there's still another 10 states that are coming later down the pike. So I also want to sort of emphasize that piece. So we can go to next slide, please. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, what states are doing to prepare, what they did to prepare, what they're kind of doing to react, and then ongoing challenges. And so, you know, I can assure you states have been preparing for a long, long time um, about how to really um, initiate this process. And remember, the end of the public health emergency and the decoupling of sort of this Medicaid continuous enrollment requirement was uncertain for many months. So states were sort of waiting and, oh, are we going to do this next month in two months? When, when is it happening? And so we're finally at the at the go at the go start line, um, which happened back in April. So I'll just say like leading up to that and really now, um, there really is a focus on coordinated messaging. One thing that I continue to emphasize in all these conversations are, you know, Medicaid agencies just talking to their enrollees is not going to be enough. Um, there are people that have been on the Medicaid rolls now for a number of years who have not had to go through a redetermination process. And so there are going to be um, really um, challenges in reaching those folks and making sure they understand that they have to actually submit information to remain eligible for the program. And so how you message that, make sure people understand is really, I think, I view as sort of a group effort. And so it's the Medicaid agencies doing their jobs, but it's also working with employers and providers and community-based organizations and schools other places where individuals are going to be touching and, and reaching out and trying to understand what's happening with their coverage outside of just the Medicaid agency. So that's a really important piece of this is how do we sort of coordinate messages across all these partners? Um, workforce enhancement. So as I said, this is an unprecedented event where states haven't had to do this many disenrollments at one time. So they have had to step staff up both with respect to their systems, but also with literally the people that are doing this work. 
So expanding their call centers, expanding the people that are reviewing eligibility determinations, that's all happening. And I have to say that's happening at a time when state Medicaid agencies are struggling to find staff. So many state Medicaid agencies have like 23%, 25% vacancy rates. So I think it just, um, I just highlight for you sort of the challenge of, of staffing up, which they are doing with contracts and external folks, but also with sort of underlying challenges in, in getting enough folks at, in the Medicaid agency to be able to do this work. System improvements, I think we all know, um, IT continues to evolve and state um, systems are not at the forefront of the, that evolution. They have been catching up and trying to improve their systems. And so there was a number of improvements made to try to, to automate some of these processes to make things a little bit faster. I do think progress has been made, but more is needed. Um, for example, um, some states just started texting their Medicaid beneficiaries for, for this unwind. Do you think like, my goodness, really? Um, but yes, this wasn't something that was, um, you know, secondary to, you know, or, or primary for state Medicaid programs. And so through this process, they've really tried to modernize some of their communications, but they have been behind um, sort of the, the um, commercial industry on, on some of these pieces. So, so improvements are, are ongoing and continue to be needed. Federal flexibility, so um, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services have offered a number of opportunities for states to implement flexibilities, you know, taking their time with like when they do the disenrollments, thinking about, you know, disregarding, you know, income and assets, present presumptive eligibility, partnering with MCOs, managed care organizations to help with um, filling out paperwork. There's all these different pieces states um, could avail themselves of in terms of flexibilities. More are coming now. Um, CMS continues to offer some federal flexibilities for states for this process. I will say, and this is just sort of me from a state perspective, um, it is a little bit late for states to make significant changes to their processes right now with respect to systems and staffing. Um, so some of these federal flexibilities that are coming online right now, it may be hard for states to pick them up and use them because it takes time to implement and they're in the in the midst of actually, you know, doing the redeterminations right now and have to focus on that. Um, I mentioned this before, partnering with um, different parts of the system. As I said, I represent the state-based marketplaces. That is going to be an opportunity for some of the people who are no longer eligible for Medicaid. They can get coverage through the state-based marketplaces or the federal marketplaces for those states that don't have state-based marketplaces. There are about 21 states across the country now that have state-based marketplaces and the remainder are on the FFM with a few more states coming online. And um, the opportunity for state-based marketplaces or the FFM is um, individuals that may have income that's a little bit too high for Medicaid and no longer qualify can go to the marketplace and continue to get subsidies um, for their cost sharing and premium so they're able to, to still access coverage at a lower cost. So I think that's going to be an important um, transition of coverage piece in all of this for those who no longer are eligible for Medicaid, as is those who could qualify for employer-sponsored insurance. Um, I mentioned learning and evolving, real-time adjustments to process. So this is key. I think we've seen a couple of states and that kind of flips over to uh, the ongoing challenges side of this. Um, we have seen um, high percentages of procedural disenrollments um, for the states that have now had experience in doing these redeterminations. And that can be for a number of different reasons. Um, I think the biggest concern is there's a lack of member awareness and response. So people are literally not responding um, to the, the need to, to re-enroll and send in paperwork and make sure they continue to be eligible. For some, that could be because they qualify for other insurance. They're, they have insurance now through their employers. They have a new job, et cetera. And those, for those people, that, that makes sense not to respond. For others, I think it's because they just aren't aware that they need to, and they could remain eligible for Medicaid. And that's, I think, the concern right now for, for um, a number of folks of how do we make sure those who are still eligible continue to figure out how to get back on Medicaid, even if they don't respond right now. So that's an area of focus, I think, um, that needs to continue on for the next many months. I will also say the early data requires, requires more analysis. States are just starting to dig into the whys of these procedural disenrollments. And it's interesting, there are some states that, you know, they prioritize populations who they didn't think would be eligible for Medicaid, they should go first. So for those states, it kind of makes sense that there's higher percentages who have procedural disenrollments, because presumably if they targeted all the people who have higher income or they think who have higher income and could have other insurance, 
okay, that story makes sense. Other states, though, didn't necessarily prioritize that way. They could have prioritized based on timing, you know, when you were, who, who's been the longest on the program um, since, you know, the continuous eligibility requirement, or they did it by a certain type of population. So right now, I think we really do need more analysis of the data to understand the reasons behind the procedural disenrollment and what steps need to be taken to make sure those who are still eligible can stay on the program, as well as those who are not understand where they need to go. Um, workforce capacity issues. So as I mentioned before, um, states have really tried to, to staff up, but the pure volume is catching up with them. And we have seen in some states, they've actually had to pause because of the backlog in actually being able to process all of the disenrollments. And that's going to continue, right? We're just at the beginning of this and there's, a, you know, 12 months to go. So I think we're going to continue to see um, some challenges in being able to really process all of this. In some states, it's complicated, like you get the notice and then if you don't respond, you get another 60 days. And so tracking all those individuals and when they send information and sometimes people send information, it's not complete. You have to follow up with them. So um, there is sort of a lot of work um, that has to go on with doing these redeterminations and the workforce capacity. And just it's again, it's just the pure volume is going to be something that states have to work through um, with their partners. And that's why um, I'm going to talk a little bit later about managed care plans and how they can help, which will be a, a, a big part of that too. System challenges. Um, there have been some um, challenges where, you know, states may have said, okay, all kids are going to be sort of later in this process. And unfortunately, there was a system error and some kids were disenrolled by accident. So that has happened. And states have had to really figure out what went wrong with this system. Why did that group get prioritized and it shouldn't have. And so again, with like any sort of real time um, big event like this, you're going to have some of those challenges. And, and I do think there's work being done to try to make sure we remedy it. The other thing I'll say is with the sharing of the data, I think publicly, I think that's an important part of this. States have to report to CMS um, about, you know, where they are in this process. And the CMS will report the data. Um, that is sort of a, it's, there's somewhat of a delay. It's not real time because there is sort of um, all these different steps in the process to report. There have been some states um, that have put up their own dashboards and they've gone beyond what they're reporting to CMS. I think those dashboards have been helpful in terms of providing some more transparency about where states are in this process. Um, but not every state is doing it the same way. Uh, and some are, you know, disaggregating data so you can see it by children or by um, type of individual. Some states have provided some insights on why you know, the nature of the procedural disenrollments, but it is varied. So I do think sort of looking forward there, there will be more work that needs to be done on the reporting of data and, and how that all fits together in understanding this, this, um, this unwind as it proceeds. So I'm happy to answer questions later um, at the end of this. Okay, next slide, please. Um, okay, so I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about innovation. Um, because there's a lot happening as always in Medicaid. And so we can go to the next slide, please. So one thing I wanted to just talk about is like, a, I feel like a fundamental piece um, of the work in Medicaid is man Medicaid managed care. So I'm not gonna date myself, but when I started in, as a Medicaid lawyer way back when, there was actually a much smaller number of people um, enrolled in managed care plans who are eligible for Medicaid. So, cause originally the Medicaid program was really a fee for service program where Medicaid contracted, state Medicaid agencies contracted directly with providers, made payments directly to those providers providers and the providers, you know, gave the services to individuals. Now um, the system is, is really evolving in, in quite a different way. 72% of Medicaid beneficiaries national, nationally are enrolled in comprehensive managed care organizations. So what that means is state Medicaid agencies are contracting with managed care organizations and paying a capitation rate per enrollee for those individuals enrolled in that plan. And then the managed care plan contracts with providers and pays providers for services. So the system is, is quite different from where when it was first um, in, it, at its inception in the 60s and even in like the, the 80s and 90s. We really are moving towards a, a dominant uh, Medicaid managed care system. Um, you'll see 52% of total Medicaid spending is to MCOs, and now we're we're really seeing an expansion of Medicaid managed care just to areas such as behavioral health services, pharmacy benefits, and long-term services and supports, which traditionally had been carved out of managed care plans and really were still operate on a fee-for-service. 
um, basis. And the reason I wanted to just explain that to you is when we talk about Medicaid innovation, we have to talk about how states are working with their managed care plans because they are right now at the forefront of serving beneficiaries and contracting with providers. So to just talk about like what a state can do by itself um, is one piece of the puzzle, but another piece is how are states really working with their plans and ensuring accountability through their plans for change and improvements in the system. Okay, next slide, please. So I wanted to just talk about a couple of examples of innovation um, that, are, that I feel like are fast and furious right now. Um, so one is on health-related social needs. And really, um, there is a whole set of six states have received these waivers um, recently from CMS. And it's really about focusing on housing, food, nutrition, extreme weather. Um, so how do we think about supporting an individual in all of these other areas to improve their, their core health? Um, so it's not just about clinical services, it's about the, the pieces that surround them. Um, there's recent guidance from CMS with a framework, and there are many, many more states in the queue wanting more of these flexibilities. So I definitely think that's a trend in terms of innovation and continued sort of thinking about Medicaid a little bit differently. Um, community reentry and transitions for individuals who are incarcerated. So states have for a number of years now really wanted to be able to provide, there's a federal prohibition on providing Medicaid coverage for services for people who are in prisons and jails. Um, and so states have wanted to request a waiver of that so they could provide, you know, 30, 60 day before release Medicaid coverage so people can actually access those services. And once they're released, there's a better transition to care. So um, California is the first state to receive a, a, a waiver for this coverage, and there are 13 states behind California that want to get this approval. CMS has released guidance, and I think there's going to be continued um, push and probably approval from CMS for more states to actually um, provide that type of coverage. And then on the home and community-based services, and I know I have to wrap up quickly, so I'll just say quickly that there was a lot of flexibilities in home and community-based services of serving the aging and disabled in their homes because we had COVID and people could not leave their homes. Um, and a lot of states are con considering thinking about how to continue those innovative practices after COVID and really understanding what they can do with things like telehealth, family care, giving meal services, provider requirements, and reporting. Um, next slide, please. I don't know what I have left. Um, and then I'll just talk briefly about um, Medicaid postpartum coverage. So it, there is a real focus on maternal child health and particularly addressing maternal mortality because of the um, really disparate rates for um, Black populations as one example of, of where we're really falling short in our in improving outcomes. And you'll see a number of states have really wanted to um, extend normally postpartum coverage was like 60 days after you have your baby, you're no longer eligible for Medicaid as a as a pregnant woman. And that led to a lot of, you know, disruption in care um, and really, um, I think, hurt um, both outcomes for both the baby and the mom. And so the majority of states have now wanted to extend that um, Medicaid eligibility to 12 months. And you see on this map um, how many states have already done that and more are going to be coming. And during that postpartum coverage period, there's a lot of thinking and innovating about what kind of services should be covered. How are people really accessing those services? Should we provide um, access to different types of workers like doulas, midwives, community health workers to really supplement access to care and make sure that um, moms and babies are going to have better outcomes um, coming out of all of those pieces. So, and I think that was probably it on the innovation side. Let me see. Next slide, please. Yes. And so the next two slides are just resources for both um, Lynn's organization at JDEC and my organization at Nashby. So I think I'll turn it back to you, Allison, so we have time for questions. Thank you so much, Amy, and thank you, Lynn. I can um, say myself as a former Hill staffer in Health LA that I, well, I appreciated this in my today life, um, but would have um, really valued this as a Hill staffer just to get like a lightning speed graduate course in Medicaid, um, as well as what's happening in the field right now. So thank you. Um, and if folks take just one thing away from today's webinar, I hope that you will think of Haney and Lynn as resources and RWJF as a resource on Medicaid for information that's relevant to your state, to your district, and what's happening um, in the Medicaid program more broadly. So we are not done yet. We are now going to transition to questions from the audience. Um, please enter your questions into the chat. We've had several come in that are excellent um, and some that we'll be able to respond to in the chat with some targeted resources. 
Um, but I'm going to start um, with a question from Jody about the Medicaid unwinding, which is, is determination of el eligibility only for those who enrolled in Medicaid during COVID or for everyone who currently participates in Medicaid? And I will turn over to whoever unmutes first, which is Hamey, <laughs> take it away. Um, it is for everyone. Um, so it doesn't have to be just those that, that enrolled during COVID um, because those redeterminations were halted. So if you were on Medicaid before COVID, you weren't redetermined. And so now it will be your turn to get redetermined. Um, and I, I would just add that, you know, states do return redeterminations every, prior to COVID every year. So everybody was redetermined either at six months or 12 months. And so this is a process and, and there, is a, there is a drop in enrollment during redetermination just before COVID. So some of that is anticipated and a lot of those people come back on. And that's what, you know, we're hoping that there is like a dip in, in uh, Medicaid eligibility and people will come back on when they realize, oh, I'm not enrolled anymore. I need to go back and re-enroll. Great, thank you both. Mm -hmm. um, and then for new enrollees in Medicaid moving forward, is there any new or are there different um, determination criteria? So as um, renewals begin, has anything changed from pre-COVID um, in terms of who is eligible for the program? I don't think so. Yeah, I was just thinking yeah. yeah, no, I, I think for the most part, it's going to be the same eligibility criteria. Some states have opted to um, incorporate some of those flexibilities where there is some income disregard and asset disregard that they didn't do prior to COVID because um, CMS is allowing for that flexibility during this process. Um, but I think over like a big picture macro, it's it's yeah. it's the same eligibility criteria. And there are a couple states that have expanded Medicaid during this time, so they'll have new criteria. For those couple states that are coming online at the same time as unwinding, thinking of South Dakota, I don't know. There's a couple others that are just doing the expansion. So it's like an added. That's a good point. Group. Right. We mm -hmm. have these other big changes in the right. states that have taken mm -hmm. up expansion in the last couple of years. Um, so another uh, data question for you guys. Um, are you aware of data available on the percentage of those who have been disenrolled who are now uninsured versus those who switched to another form of health insurance? Are we still figuring this out? Are some states, do some states have a good understanding of that? Um, or is it still premature to understand? That is the million dollar question. That's the million dollar. Um, <laughs> yes, yes. There are, um, I'll just say from my um, perspective, states are very interested in understanding this of like where individuals are going to go if they're mm -hmm. no longer eligible for Medicaid. We're still too early to be able to track that. And I will say there's not a clear systematic way to track that either. Mm -hmm. So some states are actually going to be doing consumer surveys um, mm -hmm. of, you know, where are you going after you leave Medicaid? And, you know, that's going to all be um, dependent on those individuals responding to such surveys. Um, but that's, that's going to be a really important point. Like, are they going to employer sponsor turns if they're not going to the marketplace? Place or they're not going back to Medicaid or, or they're going to be uninsured. So I think there's a lot of data analysis ahead for us. It's kind of interesting because HHS has, and I'll, I'll send it to the group, has a nice pie chart on what they predicted would happen. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we have a lot of people who are like, this is what we think is going to happen. And that's like a nice, um, very kind of simple pie chart of where people they think people are going to go. And so there's just a lot of researchers have been, you know, we've been putting our heads together, like, how can we get a handle on this in real time? And it's very difficult. And as Amy said, we're working with a couple states who are doing disenrollment surveys that hopefully will provide us some additional information. But stay tuned. And as Amy said, like, some of them haven't even started yet. So, um, so we've got a ways to go. Uh, this is a question for me, I'm going to um... Just take moderator's privilege. What are the um, organizations or websites that you will turn to? Of course, plug your own organizations as appropriate for tracking, you know, as data is coming out for analysis of what's happening with the unwinding. Who are you looking to for that kind of analysis? Mm -hmm. Well, we're working with State Health Value and Strategies, which is um, an RWJ funded program out of. Um, led by Heather Howard out of um, Princeton. And we um, 
and I put in the in the chat that we are we're documenting all the states that have dashboards and trying to keep those up to date. So if you go there and want to look for your state and what they're what they're putting up on their dashboards, and then Amy said they're, you know, they all use different definitions and different, you know, categories and do it a little bit differently. But if you, you know, want to focus on your state, we can help you sort of um I interpret those dashboards. The other place that I go is John, um, the advocates, Joan Alkers at Georgetown Center for Children's and Families. She's on Twitter and she's like on it. She's like, and she's tracking, her metric has been the procedural denials. And so those are the, as Haney said, those are the things like they didn't return the letter or they didn't get the letter and they didn't respond. And so we're, the states are just dropping them. And some states are like trying you know, we're gonna we're gonna send two letters and then a phone call and then we'll drop them. And some states are like, we're gonna do one letter and then they're dropped. And those are called procedural denials. And those are the ones we're most concerned about. Um, and so Joan Alkers, Georgetown Center for Children's and Families. Um, I don't know, Amy, who, el who else? Yeah, um, the Kaiser Family Foundation has done a really good job of tracking some Kaiser of Kaiser has data. another, yeah. So, so I would definitely recommend yeah. um, going to Kaiser. And we have been um, working closely with the um, National Association of Medicaid Directors, NAMD. They're not putting out as much data, but they are putting out a lot of explanations. And they are really at the heart of working with um, Medicaid directors and their staff. And we're partnering with them um, of trying to understand some of this. I would also just plug like the state dashboards themselves, which like, yeah. you know, yeah. um, you know, is tracking. But that's where I think you're going to get the data. Mm -hmm. And CMS is going to be pushing out, I think it's September, their big report about um, um, the marketplace. Um, so understanding what their states have to report to CMS on the Medicaid side, and then they also are going to put out the marketplace data. So I think that is going to be a really good place to look to. Great. Thank you both. Um, we have time for one final audience question, um, and I'm going to uh, combine it into, I'm going to combine two questions so we get a um, biggest bang for our buck here. Um, so the initial question is, how can Medicaid address the social, social determinants of health? And then more broadly thinking about Medicaid state innovation, are there set categories at the federal level um, that states can decide whether they want to apply for those or can states be developing ideas and submitting um, those proposals to the federal government for consideration? A great question. Um, I think there's um, there is a set of guidance that CMS has put out there to say here's your opportunity states for thinking about. They're calling it health related social needs. They've renamed it, and there's def definitely categories of um, flexibilities they've already granted in things like supportive housing, short term rental assistance, um, domestic violence support, food insecurity. Um, child care. So I think there's different pieces. Again, they're, they're trying to walk the balance of there's all these other federal programs that pay for this and Medicaid is, you know, is fundamentally a health program. It shouldn't be sort of expanding beyond it, but they see the opportunity and need for innovation in, in Medicaid playing a piece of this. So I would say there's that. And I think states can follow that and they can follow, you know, other states that have gotten these types of approvals and say, we want to do it like that and, and try to get it approval that way. But I also think there's flexibility for states to think creatively about how we might want to do it differently and try to negotiate um, their own sort of set of health ways, social needs. I'll just say um, in like both this space and the incarcerated space, you see the differences between states because they want to control their own budget too, right? This is a federal state partnership. States put money into this program as well. And so each state is very cognizant of like, how much are we going to able to, to, to spend on this innovation? And where do we want to target and focus because of the needs of our, the people in our state? I would just add to that, that they're using their MCO contracts to add language to require managed care to do do different things. Yeah. Like you have to set goals for um, equity and expansion, and you have to address social determinants health and list those and collect good data and report. And, and some of those are more aspirational, but they're starting to say, you know, we want you to start thinking about this and how you're going to how you're going to address these issues that we find, you know, are a priority for us and our state. Great, thank you both. And I know we had um, a lot of other great questions come in, including in advance of today's session. And so we are, we've noted those questions and we're gonna try to follow up, um, including about some of the state specific questions that we got and connect you um, 
um, attendees to uh, resources to help answer those questions. So we are coming to a close of our session today. I want to extend a huge thank you to Haney and Lynn for your insights, for your perspective, for your experience um, in Medicaid and, and all of the work that you're doing as well. Um, and a thank you to everyone who participated in today's session. We appreciate your time and your interest. We've put a link in the chat for a brief anonymous survey. Um, we appreciate anyone who um, can take a couple minutes to complete it. It helps us to plan future events that best meet your needs. Uh, we'll also follow up by email with a recording of this webinar and a link to the survey. Thank you all so much and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.